racking my brain one good prayer. I mean, the cancer diagnosis in general as a global statement would be that it was a wake-up call to life. It was a wake-up call about how I wanted to live my life. And I asked myself that question, am I living the life I want to live? And the answer was no. As the youngest of three children, I spent a lot of time alone. And so spending a lot of time alone, playing alone, imagining, having an inner life, I began to develop my inner life immediately. Some of the first thoughts I ever think of was before I could even speak, being in a high chair and watching my family interact. And then when I was alone, just having a world, an inner world of my own, places inside of myself that were that were safe and fun and interesting. and I could be my own company. I always knew I wanted to go to California. My best friend's dad lived out there and she lived out there. and There was just a draw to, to go check that out. So as I say, I took a left hand turn and, and kept going. I was looking for the perfect job and I found it. I, I found a job in the music business on the other side of the desk working for Dean Markley strings and amplifiers. And they're a musical manufacturing company. So they make guitar strings and drumsticks and amplifiers. And um, I was hired as the marketing and artist relations person. So it was perfect. So I had a marketing degree and being a musician, I was interested in uh, you know, what people were doing. And it was my job to go greet musicians at the airport and bring them, bring them to the show and meet them at Soundcheck and bring them strings. And, and uh, it was great. It was a great education. Mostly it taught me that uh, these wildly talented individuals who would be sitting in my, da in my office were, were starving, you know. So it wasn't so much about how good you were, it was who you knew and, and how you just made your way. And I married my best, one of my best buddies. We would do a lot of mountaineering and snow camping up in the Sierras and ski camping and We'd go out in the fall and we'd put ammo boxes in the trees filled with brandy and chocolate and salami and all these heavy things. And then after it snowed and in the spring when it was a little bit more forgiving, we'd, we'd go out there and ammo boxes filled with food would be in the trees and we'd be out there for a couple weeks and it was really fun. I would leave San Jose off and I'd go down to the Big Sur Coast and I would go to the Esalen Institute. Um, that's where I met my second husband and it was just literally love at first sight. I was, we were at, at Esalen, you bust your own tables at this wonderful dining room with all that health food. It's all this organic vegetarian food and, and I was putting my tray up and I hear this, this voice of saying, you have you have really beautiful hair. And I turned around and it was the guy that I had seen earlier walking down the thing and I thought he had really pretty hair. So I said, oh, I was thinking the same thing about you. And, and um, so off we go into this, into this romance and it was really love at first sight. And a couple days later, we, we'd watched the Milky Way cross the sky a couple nights in a row in those baths and, and his name was William. And, uh, and I told him my name was Marcy. But then later I said, you know, my real name's Marcel, and I've been going by Marcel lately. And, and he said, oh, you know, what's your, what's your middle name? And, and I said, Renee. And I said, what's your middle name? And, and he said, Randolph. And so I thought, great. I bet your last name's Hurst, huh? And he said, yeah, actually it is. And I got kind of scared because I thought, Okay, the first guy I meet after this divorce is a lunatic thinking that I'll be impressed, you know, because he's William Randolph Hearst and he's going to kill me here in the night. And, and I said, well, if you want to be William Randolph Hearst for the weekend, 
I'll be Elizabeth Taylor. And that was how that 10-year relationship started. And, um, and I became Mrs. William Randolph Hearst II. Wash me with laughter, change my ever after. Where we'll end up is anyone's guess. Love at best makes a mess. We'll both that we yes. Everyone starts out in love. Well, the conversation about how spirit came into my life is a little touchy for me because I don't want it to sound like, you know, poo, you know, you're healed or, you know, some thing that gives organized religion, you know, its bad name. Because it's not an organized thing that I experienced. I experience and experienced a real shift and a real opening. And, you know, traditional hippie, trippy California thing. You know, I go off to this workshop and really the workshop was about sitting still. We didn't speak to each other, the participants. You know, I didn't really want to go. My husband kind of forced me to go. And I didn't need any new friends. I didn't need any new stuff. You know, I just, this thing, this place was supposed to be great. I was supposed to be there. And so I went. And I spent a week in silence and in meditation. So there's that place again. So I go to that little place that I had developed when I was a child. And it became this garden, it became this place, it became a world. And we had an exercise to write down what you wanted in your life. And I wrote down that I wanted spirit. Spirit being the creative life force that is contributive. It doesn't consume, it contributes. You know, it doesn't take, it gives. I wanted to tap into that, you call it the light, you could call it uh, the universe, you can call it God, anything you want to call it, it's the same thing in my book. And I wrote it on the paper and the exercise was to throw it into the fire. And I did, you know, I did my little exercise. And then I saw it in my mind, this light, like a little It came. And it just filled everything, and it's never left, and it's just there. And it wasn't kind of, you know, I fell on the ground and started writhing or anything. It wasn't all that. It was very quiet and very subtle and unpretentious or anything. It was very private. It had nothing to do with anybody else. And I, you could say I was saved. Some people call it being saved. Um, the language of it doesn't matter. But the reality of it is that that life force entered my life and it became part of that filter that everything would go through. 1994 when my mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and they gave my mom two to three months to live and so I thought I really want to spend as much time with my mom as I as I could because I realized I had taken it for granted. I had headed west, I'd been out there for Ultimately, I was out there for almost 20 years. And I think I always thought my family and everybody would be there. And I realized that that wasn't true. So I started to come back to North Carolina. They, my parents had retired down to the Outer Banks, where we used to summer. And they retired there in 1984. So um, William and I, my then husband and I, um, bought a police in the neighborhood where my parents lived so that I could spend as much time as I could with my mom for what we thought was only gonna be a chunk of time. Turned out she lived for two and a half years and she lived really well for two years of that. So we had fun, she helped me decorate the house and we told each other our secrets and had we known that she was gonna live longer than two months we might not have told each other all of our secrets. In fact, later somewhere down the line we were joking about how we you know, if we knew that you were going to live for two and a half years, I never would have told you that. But it was really lovely to live with all those secrets out. Because for those two and a half years, we really knew each other, got to know each other really well. 
as equals, not as mother-daughter, father-daughter so much. We became, uh, you know, adults, individual sovereign adults together. Come October, I, I found a lump in my breast and up high in my chest. And um, I knew it wasn't right. I knew it was something different. So I went to the doctor and didn't tell anybody about it because I figured eh, if it's nothing, then it'll be nothing. But it wasn't nothing. Well, the cancer definitely did do something to my marriage. And what it did was a, it was a wake-up call. I mean, the cancer diagnosis in general as a global statement would be that it was a wake-up call to life. It was a wake-up call about how I wanted to live my life. And I asked myself that question, am I living the life I want to live? And the answer was no. And I was a little bit surprised and a little bit not surprised. Cancer helped me to realize that I'm not in control of much except what I choose to give my attention to. Because what I give my attention to is my life and how I'm going to gesture toward that, my attitude about it. We weren't an allied team. We were in different places. And then the cancer diagnosis, I was standing on a different road, I was standing on different ground. We were in two different places. So I go off back to North Carolina where my family was. I go through a year of treatment. I get where I don't have any sign of disease. My husband was not there for a good portion of it, but he kind of came back into the picture. And I went back to California with high hopes to patch everything up and have this whole new wonderful perspective on life. And you know, he just, he just wasn't gonna be there. And before I experienced it myself, it was just like when my mother was sick. I, I watched other couples, you know, I was a caregiver and I was there, and so I watched other people have divorces during their illness and in my support group. And I thought, what? Why? That he could be her hero. What is up with that? And I've come to understand that it's those, that, those roads where you're, where you're standing is just two different places. And unless the spouse or the partner come to that road, there's no future. Because I had gone through all of this with my mom, I knew her doctors, I knew the hospitals, I knew the way to get there, I knew the drugs that she took, I knew the, the, the treatments I tried to give her to, to try to relieve some of the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. And, and all of a sudden, I was in the exact same place. And my marriage was uncertain and shaky, and so I knew that I needed my family. So I went to the house that we had bought in North Carolina, and I went to my mother's doctor's, and I went to, and sat in those same chairs. It gives me goosebumps even today to think about it, and the smells and the sounds, and it was horrifying to be back into those places with me now sitting on the other side. And I realized, um, as compassionate as I tried to be with her, I had no idea what she was going through. And until I went through it myself, uh, I had no idea. Another year blooms. It was over. My life was over in California. And one day I, I packed up Charlie and I packed up my guitars and my stuff and, and I drove down that driveway down that big fancy hill and uh, drove back across the country to the house in North Carolina. And I could feel in my bones that something was wrong. I mean that metaphorically, but I also mean it literally. So I went to uh, Duke University Hospital to get scanned and find out what was going on, and I knew it wasn't good. And I had metastatic advanced breast cancer in my bones in my spine, in my hips, in a lymph node in my chest. And uh, here we go again. So I, I received high dose chemotherapy with a stem cell rescue. Some people call it a bone marrow transplant. I was going through some heavy chemotherapy because some breast cancers, especially in younger women, are very resistant to the chemotherapy drugs. So they wanted to make sure that these particular 
lesions and this particular cancer cells would respond to conventional treatment because higher doses of conventional treatment wouldn't be any better. They would just make me really unwell. So I came down here, I was pretty weak and ball headed and I burnt my head, you know, blisters on my head from being on the beach. But Charlie and I spent a week in, in the little cottage getting ready to um, submit to this program. I just wanted the biggest guns. I just, I just knew that I never wanted to ever wonder if I should have done something bigger. And I'm spending the night in this isolated room, fully aware of, of my feelings and what's around me and knowing that I'm going to be back here in this bed going through high dose chemotherapy soon. It was kind of funny because the nurses had a live body, somebody that was talking. So they would come in and they would talk to me all night. I didn't get any rest. And I was really ministering to them because it's very stressful, their job. These people, they're dying of this treatment. They're dying of their illness. It's so intense. So the, in the middle of the night, I just got the sense that somebody was not well right next to me. In, but the rooms were individual, isolated environments. So I just felt this thing next door, that this major thing was happening. This, somebody was dying. And all night, I really just prayed for that person. I didn't know what it was, what I was feeling. And I focused on that person, kind of to get me through, really, instead of focusing on myself. And in the morning, I'm sitting on my bed. I'm waiting. Let me go. I want to get out of here. And there was all this commotion out in the hallway. And it turns out that the person next to me did die. She had an allergic reaction to, to the chemotherapy. She was getting exactly what I was going to get in a couple weeks. After I survived the transplant, um, um, I went home and it was September and the Summer Olympics were going on in Sydney. And I, I love the Olympics. The house was filled with boxes. I hadn't even moved in. So I would be on the couch or I'd made a bed in the living room or I'd be in bed. And when a commercial would come, I would get up and I'd go to the box and I'd just take something off the top and I would either put it away or put it in the giveaway box and then I would sit down because that was really all I could do for a very long time. So I moved into the house a box at a time, you know, and and I really moved back into life a breath at a time, a box at a time because I broke it down to every breath because it was so uncomfortable that I knew that if I would just string breaths together that I would eventually be alive again. And I actually put on the wall, it said, breathe in, God is with you. Breathe out, you're not alone. What's up? <laughs> Pretty easy. You just gotta act like you're a doctor. <laughs> this stinks? Nope. I came home from Duke and it was after my first year checkup and I had all the CAT scans, chest x-rays, blood work, you know, everything that they can look at. And it was clean. And I went home and I sat on the back porch and I just knew that what I wanted was to fall in love again and to have my whole life be about music. And I met Lou about six weeks later and my whole life is about music and I'm in love. I'd rather love you five minutes than never end. The way the song Five Minutes came about, I guess it happened years ago when Marcy was, uh, we were sitting on the couch and Marcy was telling me that, uh, that, that 
she wanted to, to give me an option to uh, to find some to keep searching for somebody else, you know, um, uh, because uh, she wasn't sure how long she was going to be on the planet, and uh, you know, but nobody knows those sort of things. And I told her that I, I'd rather love her five minutes than um, than never, you know, than than not, never have that opportunity. I've had two surgeries. The first one was to remove my left breast where the original cancer was. And then I, after I was genetically tested and I found out that I had BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations, that gave me the information I needed to then have the other breast removed and a total hysterectomy. And I did that all at the same time. And my other sister who, was, who has BRCA2, we had our surgeries together at Duke. So she had her hysterectomy and I had my surgeries, we had a little party. I think it was the moment when I first saw my chest. You know, cancer is, the experience of cancer has so much loss in it. And I lost my role in my community. I lost the role in my family. Um, I lost my freedom. I lost my health. I lost the sense that I was gonna grow old and, and you have gray hair and be an old person. And I lost parts of my body, you know. And so when I first saw my chest, having lost one breast, um, I was surprised. It was just kind of like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. And when I realized it was okay, I wanted everybody to know it was okay, or that it can be okay, that you can find a way inside of the loss of a body part or, or whatever, that it's okay. And it was okay for me to learn how to ask for help, where I was always the helper and the caregiver. I needed help and I needed care. I'd like to dedicate it tonight to cancer survivors, my fellow cancer survivors, and the people who cared for us when we needed you. It's called Follow Me. Christ is the door to my salvation I will be safe always for I believe he protects me from false witness the lure of sin my soul from greedy thieves the great shepherd who never leaves me my truest friend a gift from God above the light of man the way to life abundant all who follow are brothers in his love follow me I know Follow me, I give my life for you. Follow me. I don't have cancer now, and I am likely to have a good long remission now that I'm six years out, but it's like a cloud or, you know, some weather that follows me where I go, everywhere I go. It's a filter that almost everything goes through. The more that time goes by, it seems like it's the holes of the filter are bigger, you know, so it's not quite so present in every single decision. I've made a few decisions without even considering it, but only a few. It really is a shadow that follows me. I'm self-conscious about it a lot, you know, no, there's no denying that, but most of the time I forget about it. And then when I do get self-conscious, I do remember that, that I look very athletic. So people have asked me, you know, are you a marathon runner? And I say yes, because <laughs> I ran a marathon. And uh, then one day, um, 
on this very stage, I stepped off the stage, and this woman, she said, oh, honey, you are the sexiest flat-chested woman I've ever seen. And I said, thank you. <laughs> and then I told her why. Well, when Marcy decided to have her, her uh, right breast removed, I felt really bad about it. I thought, you know, it was horrible, you know, uh, but you have to weigh it out. Um, what's what's uh, worse, uh, the chance that she could get sick again, you know, by keeping it or, or just getting rid of it and, and uh, being done with it, you know. And uh, when, you, when you think of it in those terms, is it's better to have the whole person, you know, alive than, than it is to have the, the, the chance that that breast might become a problem later on. I had this, I call it my fakie, and I was going to the gym, and I go to the gym, and I'm on the treadmill, and, and looking around, and I look down, and I forgot to wear it. And I, and I start sweating and freaking out and looking around to see who saw me. Nobody noticed. It was just like those dreams where you have when you're on the school bus and you're naked, but nobody notices. It's just like it, and I've never worn it ever again, never. It just, it just was a hassle. It just didn't make any sense. So for me, cosmetic surgery was having the other breast removed because then I was even. It was more difficult being uneven than, than just being flat. And I know I always have the choice. My surgeon gave me the, the greatest gift. He said. Give yourself a few years. Get out, get rid of the cancer first. Let's just focus on the thing that's really important right now. And he said, you know, not that your breast is not important, but let's just focus on getting you well. And then you can always have reconstructive surgery later when you're done. And I would never have thought about that if he hadn't suggested it. I thought, you gotta do it all at once. I have to wake up and be complete and have that. And what I've come to understand is that even if I did have an implant or if I had any other kind of procedure that would give me a form of a breast, it was never going to be my breast. And as a young person, I was, I was little, I was compact, and I was a gymnast. And uh, in the seventh grade, I grew 10 inches in one year. So all of a sudden, I was this tall, gangly person, and it really ruined my gymnastics career. But uh, I became this tall person, and I was always strong, and I liked to ski and climb mountains, and, and you know, my body was always there for me. So when I was diagnosed with cancer, it really did feel like my body was turning against me. And I did a lot of work to, to not hold that thought for very long because you know, it's not a friendly thought. My body served me really well. My body wasn't turning against me. It was just a tumor. <laughs> but to lose that energy and to have that change was really difficult because I just took it for granted. I, I think a lot of the awakening is to not take things so for granted. So my breasts were, were you know, small and lovely and they were my friends, but when one of them got sick, and that's what I tell kids, because sometimes little girls will come up to me and they'll say, what happened? And little babies will, mm. and the way I hold it and the way I explain it is I say that um, my left breast got sick and me and the doctors decided to take it away so that the rest of me wouldn't get sick. This little girl one time asked me when I was in a bathing suit, and I told her that. She said, oh, hmm. And she turned around to go jump in the pool, and she stopped and turned around and came back, and she said, does that happen to all girls? And I said, no, honey, no. And she said, okay, you know. And I'd like to say, I would, if she was older, I would have said, just the lucky ones. <laughs> I called it the basement. The cancer diagnosis for me is like being dropped into a basement. And in the basement it's dark and it's lonely. And the people that could come down into that basement and sit with me in that suffering and in that fear and in that pain and in that uncertainty and in those losses, 
Those were the people that truly helped me. And I remembered that when I recovered, I wanted to offer a hand in the dark to other people that faced cancer, specifically breast cancer, but cancer in general. So I joined the Reach to Recovery program with the American Cancer Society. And what that is, is I get referrals from their main center about women who are newly diagnosed or about to have surgery or about to come home from surgery. And I go over to their house and I, and I meet with them and, and listen and just be there with them. I think the strongest thing, the most important thing about doing that is that, that I show up at their door and I have my hair and I have my life back and it can, you know, if it can happen for her, if she can do it, then maybe I can too, as I think what happens. So offering a hand in the dark to other people that face cancer and maybe having a little bit of something else to think about instead of how can I get reconstructed so I have a breast again and how can I not die and how can I make it through not being able to go to work and all the, those issues. There's another thing to think about in there, which is, you know, how can I use this to make my life better? You know, how, how, is, how is this good? And I think I'm painfully positive. I think I'm insanely positive sometimes about things because I really am always looking for the good. I'm looking for the good in, in people. I'm looking for the good in situations. I want them to take away some tools that will help them through the same journey or a similar journey of life-threatening illness. A sense that they have everything that they need right inside of them. They don't have to look anywhere outside. On the edge that, of uh, old romance, that they are their own the universe, that they can be their own comfort, that they have Still their the tools, that they have the their heart, and oh, that uh, and they, have, they have a choice about happiness and where their attention is and how their life is going to be and just another way to look at something that for many and in the media and out in the world that it's so devastating. It doesn't have to be so devastating. Well for posterity's sake, the Icarus Monument to Flight in Kitty Hawk put out a call for people who wanted to sponsor bricks. And then what do you want on your brick? And I had, I wrote down, live while you're alive. Hoping that people would see that, walking around this beautiful monument to flight. You know, it's just an amazing thing. Leaving the earth, you know, live while you're alive. And it's on the liner notes of our Home to Me record, is that brick. And it's in the ground, and it's mortared in, and it's going to be there forever. Live while you're alive. Dead girl walking on a lonesome road headed to the chair. Dread comes knocking, racking my brain for one good prayer. Dead girl walking, dropped down in a basement. 